So I, I think it's it's an interesting perspective that a human being, when they see pride in action outside of them, they see the true colors of pride. Hey everyone, hopefully you're doing well. Welcome to the Jesus King podcast. I'm back with Emil. How are you doing, Emil? Well, thanks. How are you? Good, mate. Um, we had a really fun time, me and um, Abraham, and and that was amazing. So I, I had an opportunity to do three videos with him. So yes. that was a big blessing for us. Uh, we even had just the most recent one. I think it was about aliens. Yeah. I think that was the one. Um so it, it was an interesting topic. Yes, yes. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of laughter. Um, it was just an easy conversation, um, which was a blessing. But today we're having a conversation about pride. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pride is a big thing. Pride can easily be um, hidden in us, yeah. if that makes sense, that um, sometimes we can justify our pride. Um, and we can defend our pride, right? Yeah. Um, e even when people kind of point this out and say, hey, hey, brother, I kind of noticed this about you. Uh, it, it'd be better to have a spirit of humility when you approach these, these certain, certain things in your life. Yeah. And then you're like, no, what are you talking about? You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty, you know, humble person. It's, it's very hard to say that because yeah. you're like, by saying I'm humble, like it kind of sounds very prideful. But you're like, oh, you know, I don't have pride in my life, right? Uh, it's not that it's not a challenge, but I don't have pride in my life. You have to be like Moses. You have to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if that wasn't written in the Bible, yeah, it would have been a different story. Though. Exactly. He's the most humble man. Yeah, if it's coming from it. God, then it's fine. Yeah. And that was coming from God. Oh, I think that's a good point. It's it's that sense of if if God calls you humble, then you know you're humble. Then you can be proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, proud in a good way, of course. Yeah. So, so what's in your heart, man? Well, what's in your heart when it comes to this topic about pride? I think uh, pride is, if I'm not mistaken, the original sin. Mm -hmm. It's the, the reason why everything went wrong. If if we were all um, without ego, without pride, and when I say pride, I don't mean like an honor. I mean pride as in, you know, an egotistical uh, self, an excess of self-love. So if we lacked that, if we did not have that pride, then I don't see why we would be sinning against others. I don't see why we would be sinning against God if we were selfless creatures. So without pride... I don't think any of the other sins would exist. That's interesting. That's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just okay. a thought process. It's not biblical. It's just what oh. I think based on what I've seen and what I understand. Cool, cool. What do you think? Oh, when it comes to pride, I've, I've noticed that um, when we see it in others, we hate it. Uh, but when we see it in ourselves, <laughs> we, yeah, we can't, not only defend it, it's something like, you know what? Got on me, yeah. I've, I've, you know, I've elevated to that place where I, I feel like I'm better than everybody else. I can hold my head up high. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's an interesting perspective that a human being, when they see pride in action outside of them, they see the true colors of pride. Ah. But then when it's in them, it just like mask itself into so, saying, "I'm here to benefit you." Gotcha. So when they're looking at themselves, their own pride, it's like a blurred mirror. It's like a bronze mirror. Yeah. But when they're looking at it in others, it's a very clear mirror. They can see it clearly for what it is, and it's ugly. Yeah. But in reality, they're just seeing themselves. Mm. That, that, that's how I see huh. it. And I think the lesson for me as I was growing up as a Christian, and I'm like, if you hate pride in someone else, then you should have that same attitude when it comes to yourself. Like, you should hate that pride that is in you. So, like, practice what you preach. It is, it yeah. is. And, you know, you look at First John chapter 2, 15 to 17, it speaks about, you know, like, the the areas of sins, right? The lust of the flesh, yeah. the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Mm -hmm. And that pride of life can be so deceptive. It can come in in many different ways. It came to Eve in the way of wisdom, 
when she looked at the fruit, it was good for food, right? Mm -hmm. That's the loss of the flesh. It was pleasing to the eye and would make someone wise. So it felt like, what's wrong with wisdom? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with wisdom. But if it's pride masking itself in wisdom, then that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why, like, you were mentioning the mirror, right? There's a blurred mirror. There's a clear mirror. When it comes to that blurred mirror, we always have something that comes before pride. Pride is behind that thing. But that's our excuse to pursue it. Mm -hmm. Because as a Christian, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this, you'll be like, well, I don't want pride. Of course we don't. Yeah. But then if we mask it with something else, then we'll pursue that saying, oh, that's not pride, that's wisdom, for example, right? Well, that's not pride, it's honor. It's, it's honor, or it's a position, right? Or whatever it is. Because Jesus, mm -hmm. when he was teaching his disciples, and they came, they're like, what, what can we do to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Be the least. It was be the least. But what did they mask their pride with? How, how can we pursue greatness? Yeah. So I think that's a very important point. If anyone is listening to this video, that sense, could you be masking your pride with something else? And you're justifying that because you're pursuing it, right? Mm. Because you can't say, I pursue pride. No Christian will say that. Yeah. But you could say, I pursue this. Knowledge, but then, truth, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And behind that, there is, there is an attitude, there's a spirit where it's a proud spirit. And it latches on it, to whatever it, it your does. target is. It does. A yeah. And I think that's why even a lot of people would say, I'm successful because of this. So here's my question. If pride did not... Well, let's say after Lucifer, yeah. pride ceased to exist. Would the other sins still be there? Well, most of them. Because like most of what you're saying is like everything can be corrupted with pride. If there is no pride... How would they be corrupted? Well, if you look at John, First John 2, it speaks about that within sin there's three areas. Pride of life is one of them. Mm -hmm. But there is a loss of flesh, yep. loss of the eyes. And the loss of flesh and loss of eyes, you don't need pride to pride be involved to in it. It's just a desire that comes from the flesh yeah. or the desire that comes from the mind. Because gotcha. yeah. eyes obviously don't think for yourself, right? Yeah. They're just an a tool for yeah. your mind to see. So lust would still exist, but it, so there would still be sin, but it would be yeah. a select few of sins instead of, or a big chunk of sins would be missing. Yeah, I mean, even yeah. if you take the loss of the flesh and you leave the loss of the eyes and the pride of life, you're obviously taking a chunk of sin as yeah. well. But obviously for sin to manifest itself in its fullness, you see those three things in actions in a person. Do you think it's by design that it's three? Like our triune God? I wouldn't say that. No, because sin does not reflect the nature of God. So I, I, I'm, I'm not saying yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm saying like yeah. it's like trying to mock. Oh, yeah. uh, maybe, maybe. But I don't I don't see there is a Bible verse. No, I'm not. not. I'm just asking yeah. for your opinion. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely very interesting because... Um, you know, in, in today, and we've done this also in our podcast, we yeah. focus on what people desires are, whether it's for your flesh or whether for your eyes, but hardly a lot of people talk about pride. Mm. I don't know if you've noticed, not many people talk about pride these days because it's, it's something that is so hidden behind other things that we think it no longer affects the Christian person it's common sense they yeah. shouldn't need to be talking about or we shouldn't need to be talking about it but i think um any christian is and will be affected by it whether them they themselves having pride or somebody they know and care about having mm. pride and um i think it's good to point out even if it's in your christian brother or sister um to let them know that they're going down a wrong path and to kind of catch it before it gets bigger and more problematic. Because I see like a lot of Christian leaders, I'm not going to mention names, uh, I'm not that type of person, but, you know, it's being revealed that they did horrible things. 
They still and, deny it. And most of the time it is lust, but it's what motivated that lust. Mm. What was behind it? It was this grand self image, like this they had this image of themselves as something magnificent, something so vital to the mm-hmm. kingdom of God. And it's and it kind of and from that you have all these other things happening. All this um all these sins that they do after that. It's because they have this value of themselves that's more than what they're worth. When in reality, um it's similar to what uh to what was said to Esther, which is sorry, not Esther. Was it um was it Esther? No, it wasn't Esther. Uh, what's the quote? What's the verse? It's when he says, If if you uh, don't think that you'll be saved from this that if you do not tell um the the emperor yep um that you you would uh, if god will find someone else to do it for for him okay yeah um, i think that would be an Esther story i think it was Esther. yeah, yeah. Um, mordecai yeah mordecai is the one i told her that so yeah it was Esther. my bad um so yeah and i i think it's it's the same thing it's just if you don't do what god wants he can just send someone else and in your place it's mm-hmm. not that hard for him he put you in your place he can put somebody else but people think like oh i'm some vital cog in the wheel like i i need to be there i cannot be replaced i am i am this useful servant of god this instrument that is irreplaceable when that's not the case you're easily easily replaced yeah actually as you were saying that it reminded me of luke 17 jesus gives a parable in regards to um, what's it called in regards to a master coming back and he is um, waiting for his food the mm-hmm. servant prepares it the master sits down and eat and then when he gets up Jesus saying what do you expect like the master is not you know so grateful it's the servant's job yeah. to do that and he finishes it with verse 10 in Luke 17 verse 10 He's saying, so likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. So the idea that takes away pride, I think that attitude of saying, you know, sometimes like people would do something in the kingdom and they're like, God, I've done a favor for you, Mm -hmm. kind of thing, like that attitude. Like, God, what would you have done if I wasn't part of this situation? Who would you have used other than me? Yeah, or I'm so special that if it wasn't me, you could have brought someone else, but they wouldn't have done as good as you. Yeah, And, and, and sometimes people can fall into this temptation of thinking that they are a vital piece in God's plan. They're not. That's the, that's the point. And, and that's what you read in Luke 17, that, dude, you're just an unprofitable servant. That yeah. that quote in itself, like, you're a servant that is without profit. You could, <laughs> someone else could come and take your job or even do a better job. The reason why God's using you mm-hmm. is because he's actually gracious enough to use you. Yeah. It's not because, wow, what could I have done without Emil and Martin? It's, it's <laughs> foolishness um, to think yeah. that. And I was actually praying before we got here. I was like, um, praying to God, and I said, God, um, I need help in doing what what you want me to do. Mm-hmm. And and I, and I said it to him. I was like, Yeah, the servant's asking his master for help to do his job. How foolish is that? Yeah, I am foolish. I I, I cannot do it alone. But I, to I, be I, honest with you, in that foolishness, there's a lot of wisdom. There right? is. It's just acknowledging that we are pathetic and without God, we cannot do anything. I like um, that. Yeah. Um, but God loves us despite our patheticness and he can make us great. Mm. But we have to remember that part. He can make us great. We are not great. He can make us great. Yeah. So the only reason why we are now great is because of him. We have nothing to be proud of except him. Yeah. I'm proud of my father. I'm not proud of me. And as long as we remember that, I think we'll be safe. And there's this... Um, Two verses in Proverbs, Proverbs 16. Cool. And this is why uh, pride is dangerous. And this explains it, what happens after pride. And it's uh, Proverbs 16, verses 18 and 19. It says, pride goes before destruction 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be a lowly of, of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Mm. Amen. That, that kind of connects to the earlier point that we were talking about when the disciples came and they're like, you know, how can we be the greatest in the kingdom? Yeah. He says, if you're last, you're going to be the greatest. But he says, those who are first will be last. Mm -hmm. So this kind of connects with Proverbs that if you have this pride and you think you're first, the next move is you're, you're going to be, be last, last and that's your destruction. I think that's something very important it is. To, to have that perspective and, and not to be foolish enough to say it's not going to happen to me, right? Because when we're in a place of pride, we don't see the destruction coming. No. And, and, and that's what kings, that's how kings fall. They were so drunk in their pride and in their self-confidence that they thought, yeah, I could never be brought down. And you see God humbling a lot of kings yeah. in Israel in the Old Testament. And the wise ones repent. Yeah. Whereas the unwise remain the way they are and they destroy that's it it's, it's stubbornness and, um, i think that happens to us as well we have some times where we are prideful and we don't realize it in the moment the heat of the moment whether it's an argument a debate whatever it is we have this pride and then later on god's like i'm going to humble this person yeah and he humbles that person Good and, lesson. <laughs> yeah and then and that person can either grow from it or stay the same and i think if they grow from it, perfect. Now they can be a better person. They can move forward and learn from the mistake. But if they don't, then that's where I think that's where the issue is. Yeah, that's it's important. Actually, I've also got a verse in, in James 4. And verse 1 to 10, to be honest with you, is one of the craziest rebukes in the New Testament. Uh, but we can just read verse 6 sure. all the way um, to 10. Um, and, and that's what James is telling the believers. He's not even t talking to non-believers. He, he's speaking to the church. He's saying, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I think that that's an important point to know that pride can actually stand in the way between you and God. Yeah. That can be a big obstacle. And if you continue in pride, God will continue to resist you. Mm -hmm. But if you humble yourself, God will pour out his grace upon you. And, and that's what we seek as Christians. We don't seek that God resists us, but rather than he pours his grace upon us. Mm -hmm. But then he continues here. He's saying, therefore, submit to God. And that's part of humility. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But who, who's, who's feeding your pride is the devil. If you resist the devil, you're no longer feeding your pride. You're starting to come to the grace of God and come in humility. Yeah. Um, he continues, he draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your, uh, sorry, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Which is why I'm saying like this is one of the craziest rebukes. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Wow. So th there's so much to take about this passage. Yeah. But one of the things you see that for you to get rid of pride, you resist the devil. For you to receive humility, you need to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And and he, he calls him. He's saying, turn your joy and laughter into mourning into weeping that's what we need to do that's how serious james takes is taking pride yeah he's saying it's not like oh you know you, you think i'm prideful hmm i might be yeah i need to work on that james is saying hey come to the lord and repent of that sin this is a very sin serious sin in in, in the heart of a man and that's what literally turned an angel who was close to God, worshipping God in his glory into a devil in a moment. The God in church. So, so why are we taking pride so lightly if it took someone that was so close to God to be the furthest away from God? 
I think that's something so important. If if we are close to God, we shouldn't be comfortable in, in our in our faith to say, Yep, pride can never creep into my heart. I can I can keep on talking about this. But, yeah, it's, it's a um, long topic. I mean yeah. I, I I know that some Christians now um and I hate this so much. And I, I see this in a lot of Christians these days. They say, oh, God told me. And I stop and think, I'm like, well, I don't want to say anything negative in case God did indeed tell them. But often than not, more often than not, I find that wasn't God didn't tell them. They're just trying to reaffirm their position and kind of strengthen their argument by saying God put it in my heart mm. or God told me. And I'm thinking like, I like I don't want to call that person a liar in case God yeah. did indeed speak to them. But when they do it, more often than like than not, they say that in in an argument or a debate. And then you look at it biblically, and they were wrong. And you're like, God didn't tell them. Yeah, that's the only conclusion you can come come up with. Because like, for example, if they're saying you know one plus one equals three, and then you look at the Bible, it says no, one plus one is two. You're like, wait, hold on a minute. Mm. So they're saying that God spoke to them. In the middle of a debate, they suddenly bring that up. Oh, God told me this. It's like, let's end the discussion. You're wrong now, 100%. And and and, I, and this has happened like two or three times with people that I know. And it's kind of, it's not like, oh, I read it in the Bible somewhere. No, no, God spoke to me. And I, I don't know what to say to those people. I'm just... I love them. I'm just worried about them. And honestly, like, because if they have so much pride that they have to bring God into their and lie about God and bring Him into a conversation, because it's a lie. Let's be honest. If God truly spoke to them, then yeah, that's a lie. Yeah, yeah. So I'm worried about them because the pride is so important. Their pride is so important to them that they're willing to lie about that God spoke to them. And these people are supposed to. Oh, I'm not going to suppose they are Christians. They're clearly Christians that are struggling with pride, but they're still Christians in my opinion. Mm. And from what I know about them. So, so you don't have the humility to say, brother, I've got it wrong. Say, okay, I've got no more answers. I, I, I can't defend my position. Therefore, yep. You God, were right. God gave wrong. me a revelation kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty important. Uh, as a Christian and, and even something I learned down like down the line is that don't emotionally be involved in in like you know in in conversations in debates in discussions if you're wrong you just say oh, I'm wrong or if you haven't studied the topic well enough say okay I can get back to you it's not like I have to present myself to the other person as someone who already knows what no, we're talking yeah. about. And I have to also present myself as to be on the right side. Like yeah. I'm right and I'm here to educate you. Yeah. And then God sometimes bring people into our lives saying, all right, you think you're going to educate that person, but that person I brought them into your life to correct you. Yeah. Now, if we, we were talking about this and it reminded me of when David sent, mm -hmm. God sent a prophet and the prophet said, you know what? There was a rich man who had sheep. He had a lot of wealth. But then when he wanted to make a celebration, he went to the poor man's house and he took his sheep, the one who he dearly loved, and he slaughtered it. David got up and like, well, I want to know who this man is. I want to bring justice to this. And the prophet is like, that man is you. So no, David could have dismissed it as a king. And it would have been a different path for him in life. But then he was humble enough to repent. And I'll be like, you know what? I tried to hide it. I did the wrong thing. But then God caught me and he brought someone to correct me. There's humility in that. And that's why when you read Psalms 51, God is not desiring sacrifices, not desiring these things that any man can offer. God is desiring a broken heart. 
a contrite spirit. Somebody that's uh, surrendered yeah. to him. For a person to convert, confess that they have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, that requires humility. Mm-hmm. I think that's something something really important for us to take in our daily life as Christians. Because you know what? As I read in James 4, not only pride can be an obstacle between you and God, your pride can also be an obstacle between others and God. Because when others are going to look into your life and they're like, man, that person's personality, character, it stinks. It's full of pride. Is that what Christianity is? I don't want that. So sometimes we can even be an obstacle for others and and, uh, God. So we're coming to an end. Any final thoughts? Um, Not really, no. I think we've covered most of it. Yeah, we we did. Um, I would just remind you that if if we recognize our place in the universe and how small we are in God's plan, in, in God's huge plan, right? Eternal plan. We start to recognize that God is gracious enough to use us. It's not that God needs to use us. It's that God desires to use us. Why? It's because we are part of him. We are part of his family, right? He says, uh, Jesus spoke about that he is in us and we are in him. We are, we are part of him and he wants to use us. That's his desire. But let us not have a change of mind in the sense of thinking, wait, it's not just about that God desires to use me. Is that God needs me. I'm, 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 I'm a vital part of his plan. I, w- I would encourage you not to have that mindset. I would encourage you that when God is using you, have the same uh, attitude as what Jesus said in Luke 17. God, I am an unprofitable servant. I'm just doing my job. Thank you for using me. You're not here to thank me because I'm working in your kingdom. No, thank you for using me. That's a huge honor for me. So God bless you all and we'll see you next time. Take care. Take care, bro.